Thank you, folks. I hope this microphone stretches across this way. I'm working off this musical stand. Keep it here for Charlie's music for later. Um, can I just say, girls, mila mila mahagav don kaid mila falcha. I have to say, uh, it is my absolute pleasure to be here to be a part of Leitrim's Health is Wealth this evening. It is my pleasure to be able to share in this very inspiring gathering. And this gathering, I think, is very courageous because it is taking on a topic that's very much in the shadows, and it is that of mental health. And this is, thank you, is, is being discussed in such a wonderful, open, honest and brave fashion and also proclaiming mental health with such love and compassion and that is inspiring and that leads to great healing. And I thank Hubert for allowing me to also include in your evening just a little bit of chat about my own life's work, about the consequences of the fallout from the world's worst nuclear disaster at Chernobyl, which actually happened 33 years ago on April 26th. Now that was just, you know, you could say a mere 33 years ago, but in the lifetime of radioactivity, 33 years is just a millisecond. Because of the nature of radioactivity, it goes on for infinity for the rest of time. It crosses generations, it crosses boundaries. In fact, it knows no boundaries. And in these 33 years, we're now looking at something that has been relegated by the world, you could really say, to history. And in a sense, there is a parallel with mental health. Many people would like to see Chernobyl and its aftermath disappear, relegated to the history books, and I suppose brushed under the carpet. A sense of like out of sight and out of mind. And sadly, that is very much the same, you know, at a national level uh, in relation to mental health. It's a case of, well, if you can't see it, well, maybe it just doesn't even exist. And the work of our organization is to continue all these decades later to try and alleviate the impact of the tragedy across those generations. We're now looking at the grandchildren of Chernobyl, the innocent, fragile and vulnerable children and their families, not to mention the impact on the water, on nature, their food chain, because people are sleeping, eating and breathing in the world's most radioactive environment. But hope springs eternal, life renewing, life affirming hope. We all need to have in our own deepest hearts and in the depths of our souls, that belief, that passion, that eternal hope, that firm belief, that conviction that we can do so much to continue despite the many odds and the obstacles thrown our way, to reach out for hope, to pick up again and again that shining banner of hope. And this wonderful gathering is in itself actually a great gathering of hope. And for anyone who feels right now or who has felt at some time some darkness, some despair in their lives, well, we say to one another, you are not alone in your pain or anguish. I can help you. You can be of help because we are together. You are not forgotten and you are not abandoned because we are fellow travelers, fellow human beings, brothers, sisters, and part of that same beautiful global family. And I remember clearly 33 years ago, when we brought our first container of aid from the people of Ireland directly into the heart of the Chernobyl zone. And a Russian Orthodox priest spoke for this small community of people to welcome us. And he finished by saying, thank you. Not only are you offering to save the lives of our children, but most of all, you're offering us hope to live. And we were so touched by those words that we adopted that as our motto, offering hope to live. 
And you know something? That priest was right. And while the medicines and the nappies and the toiletries and everything that we brought and was so needed by that community, he also realised that the gift really was in our physical presence, that we were offering and giving hope to the people so that they could continue to draw on that in their inner quantity of life and self-worth, to continue to hang on to, even in the midst of their suffering and darkness, and that darkness to know that light would come through and win out, and that brightness would return. And we offer hope tonight to each other, be it to the person beside you with that warm, friendly smile, or a reassuring grip of a firm handshake, maybe a gentle hug or an embrace, or some kind words. These go a long way in offering hope to one another. And I remind us of the lovely Confucius saying when he says that it is better to light a candle than to curse the darkness. And yet I know that so many of us, even now, find even that such a challenge. And what has helped me in my work and in my history to keep that flame of hope alive, even for myself, was, I suppose, really from my parents and an early introduction or an invitation to develop an awareness from a young age about the people around us in, in our community in Tipperary, people in our own community that were suffering and in need. And through community organisations like the Vincent de Paul and the Meals and Wheels and all those other wonderful voluntary organisations, I really believe that it was that early introduction to that spirit and activity of giving your neighbour, your friend a helping hand. And that really has shaped my life because we were encouraged to join in and to believe that we, even as youngsters, could do something. And what I learned from that time was that there was a great reward in my own small giving, in my very small effort, because I found the privilege was in the giving that I received so much for myself, you know, just in the development as a human being and as a decent character myself. And I still enjoy that privilege. And I would encourage everybody, because this really has to do with mental health, to pass on that spirit of volunteerism. There's nothing better than helping one another to actually do yourself the power of good and that real spirit of love and action. Always believing that together we can save the world. Now, I never remember learning words in Clonmel where I grew up, like, oh, you're an activist or you're a volunteer, because we didn't have that language then. But I do know that that early introduction to working in community in the formative years of my life has shaped me from then on till now, but also giving me an understanding that not everybody in Ireland in small towns was equal. Not everybody had food on the table. Not everybody had a warm house. And I learned from that about inequality. And I gained a deep sense of conscience and responsibility towards the rights and the equalities and inequalities within our own societies. And I'm sure it is very much the same for all of us here gathered. Because as a nation, I think that we can safely say that we have inherited the culture and the mind of caring and of volunteerism from those who went before us, giving us that sense of universal responsibility. Because where we see the suffering of others, we see it very much as our own. And as a race, I believe that we have been shaped by those who went before us, many of them volunteers for different causes. And in our own history, we know that the courage and the strength of missionary men and women really made us, as a race, the compassionate people that we are today. So in a sense, we've inherited a deep sense of justice, of commitment to community, respect for one another, regardless of sex, of race or class. We do 
speak out for those within society that feel abandoned, that feel isolated and feel marginalised and forgotten. Now, sometimes these people are within our own society, our small towns and villages, and sometimes these people are from other lands. And I'm thinking tonight of Syria, of the Syrian refugees, and I'm also thinking of the people in Yemen. But you know, it's no accident that we as a race are so outspoken for the rights of others nationally and internationally who suffer at the hands of injustice, of poverty, of racism. As we know from our own story, that we have suffered in similar ways. And I believe that the answer to where we get our compassion as a race from and our activism and our volunteerism very much is tied up with our history and our past. And I give the example of during the Great Irish Famine in the mid 1800s, when our own population of people was halved through enforced starvation and a policy of mass emigration. And this county in particular knows what it's like to be hit by that. And the direct hand of solidarity, of intervention, came to our people from a very unlikely source, from an American tribal people called the Choctaw Indians. They heard about the plight of this far distant island across the great oceans. They collected money, which was turned into shipments of grain and corn that was sent to the ports of Cork, of Dublin, of Galway, of Belfast, and kept our people alive. And us here in this room, many of us are the direct descendants of those who survived because of that act of humanity, that act of kindness. So when we see the suffering of others, either around us or abroad, it is like an echo or a reverberation in our deepest souls from something that we have experienced within what we would call our own race memory. And we have not lost touch with that spirit and it is so alive here tonight. And to help us along the way, I believe that society could do with good examples of people and good role models to inspire us. And some of those could be, for example, your parents, your neighbours, your friends, your lecturers, your teachers, somebody like Vicky Phelan, or it could be personalities like Bono or, or Bob Geldof, and some of my role models that I would try and learn from would be people like Gandhi, Martin Luther King, the suffragettes, the abolitionists, the civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid movement and Nelson Mandela and so many more. And these people and campaigns help us to realise that one can make a contribution to the welfare of the other, to the welfare of the community, of the nation, to the world and therefore to the globe. And to build on this view of seeing the world and how we contribute to making it more just and more hopeful, we need very personally to build our own reserves of hope. And I remind you again of that beautiful, wonderful virtue of hope and the proverb that hope springs eternal, eternal, because you cannot kill the spirit of hope. And I really believe that hope is the most enabling gift that we can give to one another, to be used in tough times, to be saved and used like a light in the darkness, as if to say to one another, don't give up, you are not alone. You are not peripheral. And I'm saying this mainly for ourselves because our lives and our work can often be very difficult what we have to deal with. And we too as individuals need something to inspire us, to encourage us, especially when we struggle very personally. And when that struggle is hard and we can feel like giving up. And yes, in Ireland's present economic climate, 
it would be very easy to become very despondent and to wonder if we ever have enough for our own charity because charity does begin at home and that is so true but we can also have that capacity to reach beyond our shores to those who have so little but who yet have so much to dream and hope for and I truly believe that the people of Ireland can do and still do reach out to others because of our own very difficulties. In fact, because of these difficulties, we too know what it's like to see hope's candle flicker and fade in those winds of economic storms over the last number of years. Now, I passionately have a strong sense of pride in our country and how we consistently over many generations continue to fight for justice and for what is right. And the great Jesuit and anthropologist Father Tihar de Chardin said, and I love this quote, the future belongs to those who give the next generation reason for hope. And let us be among those who hand on that torch of hope to the next generation and to keep that flame burning alive. And because of our own history, and our own history is full of hope, and that too can act as an inspiration. And there's a wonderful type of old traditional Irish song, which we probably very hear little about now, but it's known as an ashling. And an ashling is that beautiful Irish word for vision. And in times gone by, this vision or Ashling song was there to keep the spirit of freedom and of hope alive in the hearts of our ancestors in the very dark days of injustice, in the darkness of 800 years of oppression, and then in the years in particular of the great Irish famine and the years of mass emigration. Ladies and gentlemen, all of us here and your children and your children's children. We, you, are the inheritors and the bearers of that beautiful ashling, that torch, that beacon, that we must pick up again and again in our own dark days, both personal and political, and say yet again in the words of that great old spiritual, we shall overcome. And we can overcome with the help and the support from each other, aptly said in the lovely Irish proverb, is our scáchéla a varan nadina, that we live, we breathe in the shadow of each other. And by supporting one another and helping one another, we can see anew, we can hear anew, we can listen anew, we can love anew. We can also forgive anew. We can rejoice anew. And we can hope anew. Always remembering that that valve of hope in the heart and soul of all of us, that that needs to be regularly checked and maintained, regularly serviced and refreshed, renewed and reactivated, regularly relit and rekindled. And let us begin by handing on that torch of love from here tonight and let us continue to search and find, offer and seek courage and to show compassion to the other, the hopeless, the poor, the lonely, someone at home, someone sitting beside you, maybe somebody down the road and even maybe somebody as far away as in Chernobyl. And the motto of our organization, as you know, is offering hope to live. And that is what you are doing here tonight. That is what we are doing together. You too are offering hope to yourselves, to your families, to your communities here and beyond this county. For your efforts, your achievements, give hope to all, including yourselves. I believe that hope is a beautiful word. It is worth having. 
It is an idea worth treasuring, a slogan that we all need to keep ourselves going. Saying to ourselves, don't give up, keep going, I'm with you, I'm on your side, I've got your back and you are not alone. And this kind of hope, it's not silly, it's not pie in the sky, it is not unrealistic. It is like the very air that we breathe, otherwise we simply give up, we run out of steam. We need hope, I certainly need hope, you need hope and we've got to want that hope badly together. Now I have a great passion for life, I love nature, I love walking, I love singing, I love dancing, I love music. Might be joining in with Charlie even later on. But, you know, I've taken, I had, I've had a very imbalanced life for, I suppose, about 45 or even maybe more years, um, where I lived just to work. And I lost a lot because of that. And I've worked very hard in about the last three or four years to find balance in my own life. And that really has been a real renewal phase for me because sometimes the scenes that we encounter in Chernobyl are absolutely heartbreaking and devastating. And there are times when I feel that I can't go on. So I learned in the last three years that it is vital for me and for all of our team to switch off sometimes and to see the beauty and the brightness of life as well. And even though I have seen much sadness in my work all of this time, but I have also seen great spirit, I have seen courage, tenacity, energy and great inspiration. And mainly a lot of that comes from our volunteers and many of you are here tonight, including the Leitrim Rose of Tralee, who is just back herself from Chernobyl, Imelda, whom I was delighted to see. And you know, all of the kindness and generous generations of Irish people that have sustained us over all of these decades. And I believe, you know, in that wonderful statement, and just to repeat it once more, that the future belongs to those who give the next generation reason for hope. And let us be among those who hand on that torch of hope and to keep the flame burning. And so with that thought, let us celebrate what we are and what we do for each other and long may that continue because in our willingness to reach out and help another we actually find our true selves so let us together work for a better and more just society embracing the dynamic changes needed within our society to bring about a better and more just world especially in the knowledge that each and every one of us has the power to make a difference. And I remember that old 60s song, we shall overcome someday. Well, let that day be now and let it begin with all of us. May I say that events like this inspire me, give me hope, give me a shot of adrenaline to keep on going, keep on going and carrying on, carrying on for as many more years as I can because I think you are all amazing. And I particularly want to say a Kogardex more to Hubert and to the lovely Valerie because they have helped to make this possible. So thank you for inviting me and inspiring me. Be proud, be proud, be proud. Leitrim, Leitrim Abu, Garv Magwiv. Well, incredible. Come here. Come here. Can I go now? I'm sorry, Mike. Thank you.